Okay, so in this third lecture, I'm going to introduce a very important example of a continuous random variable, one involving the normal distribution. So remember what I said earlier, what is a random variable? It's a function that maps a set X, S, which is the set of possible you know, outcomes you can get in an experiment, and maps it onto a real number. And the real number that it gets mapped onto, that each event gets mapped onto, is called the support of X, S of X. And in the discrete case, we had a probability mass function associated with this particular uh, set of outcomes, the support of X, and each of those elements was mapped onto a probability, right? So that's this equation one that I'm showing you here, right? And um, the cumulative distribution function is, of course, this, the sum of all the possible values ranging from X downwards, right? So that's what I've written down here. So this was the whole story with discrete random variables, right? That I showed you earlier with the help of two examples, the Bernoulli and the binomial. Now, we are going to talk about continuous random variables, but we are going to build on what we've learned from the, from the, from the discrete uh, random variable theory that I presented, right? So if you remember, in the Bernoulli and the binomial, I showed you the, these, these classic DPQR families of functions in action. With the Bernoulli, I only showed you the R Bern, D Bern, and P, sorry, this is a mistake here, it should have been P Bern, right? And in the binomial, I showed you the, all the full range of possibilities, right? In, this, in R, we can use the R binome, D binome, P binome, and Q binome function, which I call the DPQR family of functions, okay? So these functions are now going to be available for every random variable that we might need in our data analysis, practically every random variable. So in the discrete case, when we were talking about coin tosses, right, they were discrete outcomes, but you can have situations where the outcomes are no longer discrete. You can't get just a heads or tails, you get in, uh, instead a, a continuum of possible values. So one example of that is reading data, right? We often do research on eye tracking, so we have people read sentences on the computer screen, and we've got this sophisticated machine called an eye tracker, which tracks where exactly your eye is fixating, which letter the, you're fixating on when you're reading sentences on the screen, right? So that's called an eye tracker, and you can record reading times using that kind of machine, right, at the millisecond level. Now, these are continuous values, right? There might be some precision limitations on how precisely you can uh, you know, record the reading times, but in principle, there's an infinity of possible values between 500 milliseconds and 501 milliseconds. In theory, there's, there's no limit to what you can have. So that's what's called a continuous random variable, and that's the kind of data that we can model using a continuous random variable. So I'm gonna give you an example of that, right? So what's different between discrete and continuous random variables, one very big difference, is that instead of having a probability mass function, which associates with each discrete outcome of probability, as we saw in the binomial and Bernoulli, in the continuous case, we get a probability density function, not a probability mass function, but a probability density function, okay? So this, I will sometimes, uh, abbreviate as PDF, okay? So don't confuse it with PDF documents. I'm to, when I'm saying PDF, I'm actually referring to the probability density function in a continuous random variable, okay? All right, so the way I will write a random variable from now on is that if I have a random variable X, and by the way, I could use whatever variable I like, right? I could use X, I could use Y, I could use delta, I could use zeta, it doesn't matter what the variable name is there is some random variable x, I'm going to assume that that random variable has associated with it a particular probability density function in the continuous case and a probability mass function in the discrete case. So I'm going to write all such cases with this little curly thing called a tilde, right? So what I'm saying here is that the data are being produced from this probability mass or probability density function. That's what this statement means from now on, okay? All right, so, <clears throat> So let's uh, look at an example, and let's look at an example that you must have seen, you know, if you've done any data analysis in the past. I'm going to assume that, are, that the data are being generated from a normal distribution uh, with some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma, 
Okay, so these are called the location and scale parameters. And the way I would write the probability mass, uh, sorry, the probability density function for the continuous random variable would be in this form here. So this is the actual probability density function of the normal distribution, right? So what does this function do? This I'm going to explain in a few minutes. But as input, it takes a particular element in the support of x, so some reading time that you might have observed. And given some mu and sigma parameter values, right? just like we had theta earlier, now we have the parameters mu and sigma. Given some specific values of mu and sigma, you can get the result of this function. You will get an actual numerical value. That is the, the result of plugging in x into this function. Right? So it's just the standard functional uh, approach. right? OK, so this is the probability density function of the normal distribution. And our job now is to try to really understand what exactly this function means and what it's doing for us. OK, okay. <clears throat> you have probably heard about the normal distribution. It's sometimes called the Gaussian distribution, right? After Gauss, uh, who came up with it, right? And notice that in this distribution, in the canonical case, in the default case, we are going to assume that the support of x ranges from minus infinity all the way up to plus infinity. Right? So there's no limits on the lower and upper bounds in principle in this canonical case here. You can, of course, truncate a normal distribution. Right? You can specify lower and upper bound and truncate it in this way. And in fact, that will be a critical thing that we'll be doing later on. But in the usual case, right, the support of x is from minus to plus infinity. Okay? As I said earlier, mu and sigma are the mean and the standard deviation. right? And they're more generally called the location and scale parameters. You'll read more about this in the textbook. But right now, this is all we need to know to understand how this function is constructed. Okay? So I'm going to unpack this construction, talk a bit more about uh, how it works. Okay? So remember, in the discrete random variable case, we could compute the probability of a particular outcome. Right? So we could use the D-band function, for example, to compute the out, uh, probability of getting uh, one, exactly one, you know, uh, uh, that is exactly a head. Right? In the binomial case, if I'm tossing a coin 10 times, I can ask, using the D-binom function, I can find out what is the probability of getting exactly two as a possible outcome. Right? So I can, in the discrete random variable, I can actually ask questions about particular outcomes, the probabilities of particular outcomes. In the continuous random variable, you can never do that. In the continuous random variable, the probability of a particular point outcome, outcome will always be 0. The way that you can compute probabilities in a continuous probability density function is by asking questions like, what is the probability of observing a value between this number and this number? So you can have a, a different uh, set of numbers. X, let's call it x2 and x1, right? x2 will be larger than x1. What I can ask from a continuous uh, probability density function is, what is the probability of observing a value between this range? And this probability is calculated by computing the area under the curve of the normal distribution. Okay. So how does that work? So let's take a look at that. Right. We are going to use the cumulative distribution function associated, associated with the normal distribution to compute this area under the curve and uh, to compute the probability of observing a particular value between x2 and x1 or a value like x2 or something less than that right that's what the cumulative distribution function is for so let's do that okay mathematically how would we do this we would ask a question like what is the probability of observing some number like u or something less than that in this random variable. And that, of course, has to be computed using the cumulative distribution function. So now what you're seeing here is the prob probability density function. And what I'm computing in this integral is that I'm summing up the area under the curve going from u all the way to minus infinity. 
and that's why I specified an upper and lower bound in this integral. This integral is nothing else than the summation that we saw in the discrete case. If you remember, we took the probability mass function and we summed up all the values going from x or to downwards, right? That's exactly what we are doing here. We are computing the cumulative probability of x or something, uh, say u or something less than u, okay, in this case. Okay, so nothing much has changed except that we have moved to a continuous space now, okay? All right. So what we have seen today is a first example of a continuous random variable, the normal distribution. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to unpack some important properties of this distribution. This will happen in the next lecture.